the wonderful Eddie Hearn joins us, the chairman of Matchroom. Hello, Eddie. How are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. How are you doing, guys? Oh, good. I'm very well. Listen, thanks so much for coming on. We've got lots to talk to you about. But um, well done for getting this one on because it, 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 it's, yeah, finally. Why is it taking so long, Eddie? It's two, it'll be almost two years to the day, April 27th, that they first met in Scotland. And, you know, I just think sometimes, you know, the, the title, the, the build up for this fight is hate runs deep. These two cannot stand each other. And ever since that night, Jack's been very vocal, very outspoken. And sometimes that just pushes a fight further away where, you know, a champion like Josh Taylor says, no, right, I'm not fighting him. I'm not fighting him now, you know, out of principle, out of spite, out of ego, whatever you want to call it. And now, you know, the fight's just so big. I think it's the right time for both to try and settle the score, really. And both of them have got a point to prove April 27th in Leeds. Eddie, I think a lot of people, as we all know, we, we thought Jack Catterall won the fight comfortably. Um, and it's almost turned people against Josh Taylor. Is it the way that Josh Taylor conducted himself after the fight, which has kind of turned people against him? I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it? I think when you're in a fight, you know it's close. I think he knew the fight was was close. But I think it's very difficult to say after the fight, yeah, I think I might have lost that. Do you know what I mean? Any, mm. any fighter's reaction is to say, well, I have to watch it back. Or, yeah, it was a close fight. Felt it could have gone either way. No, I thought I edged it. But, you know, sometimes you're on the end of a bad scorecard from a judge and it actually affects the fighter sometimes you know and it's not actually their fault like it's not josh taylor's fault how the fight was scored but you know probably rather than saying yeah you know i was a little bit fortunate or oh, that could have gone either way it was no i won that fight comfortably and you know in most people eyes he didn't you know and like i said it's, it's been pretty uh, you know hate filled for two mm. years now the build-up's going to be unbelievable monday we're in edinburgh tuesday we're in manchester i can't wait for these two to come together because it's part of the fun you know, it's um, part of the fun to talk about what happened. Listen, you've seen so many fights, Eddie, right? That, going back to this fight, Josh Taylor, he was cut around the left eye, he was put down in the eighth round, deducted one point in the 11th as well, I think it was for punching after the bell. Is is this one of the worst decisions you've seen? Yeah, I mean, he, did, you know, Jack went into cruise control, really, in the last three, four rounds of the fight, and, and they were a few close rounds, but I don't think there was anyone really when the final bell went, that didn't think that Jack Catchell was the new undisputed world champion. And, you know, there were all the belts on the line that night. So mm. that kind of magnifies the decision even more so. It's not like a six-round fight that, you know, you lose six, six, you know, 60, 58, 54, whatever. You've lost the undisputed championship. You could have won the entire pot of gold. And nearly everybody believes he should have that night. So I think certainly one of the most controversial fights of our generation and you know you would have expect a fight so controversial to really happen next but because of what happened after because of what happened in the build-up like i say that hate between them just pushed them apart and it's taken two years to finally kick it over the line with that two-year gap as you said there Eddie, who do you think it now favors because maybe if they've got straight back in the ring josh taylor might have been able to put you know i mean put these demons to bed but the fact that now it's been two years who do you give the edge to I don't know. I mean, Jack's been nice and active under us. He's had good wins, you know, good win against Linares last time out. Josh Taylor lost last time out, but it was to Teofimo Lopez at Madison Square Garden. So it's not like he hasn't been fighting at the very elite level of the game. Josh Taylor is a fantastic fighter and he's a stubborn, stubborn man. He will be putting everything into this camp. Like They will go into this fight, not just wanting to win, but actually wanting to win this fight, dominate the fight and try and win by knockout. So, I think you're going to see a different kind of fight this time. I think you're going to see a very active fight. I think Jack Catchell doesn't want to leave anything to chance. He's talked about being aggressive in this fight. And I think Josh Taylor's got a massive point to prove all round, not just coming mm -hmm. off the defeat, but also, you know, in reflection of the first fight as well. Uh, you mentioned that defeat to Lopez. That was back in, I think, June. Uh, that means mm -hmm. there's no world titles on the line in this fight. Does that does that take the edge of it at all or not? Um, I think you'd, you'd always want a world title on the line if you could have one, but... You know, as you'll see from the build-up next week, the controversy of the first fight, you know, it's got everything. I mean, we really needed a fight like this, British boxing, to be honest with you, because obviously, you know, and I'm part of taking huge events at the moment to the Middle East, and they're doing a great job to deliver the fights that have been eluding us. But we need to keep those big fights coming in England and, and the UK and Britain and Ireland, because, you know, I think... And these kind of fights where people are going to be talking non-stop, people are going to be debating, the press conferences are going to be fiery, the head-to-heads are going to be epic. We need a little injection of two or three or four of these. And, you know, that was the big part of, of the zone really stumping up the cash to put this 
on the zone, non pay per view as well, and, and make sure that we can stage some major events here in the midst of all these mega fights in Saudi Arabia as well. Eddie, you said it there, and you've been making massive fights for a long time, um, and you've got the whole Saudi aspect. Is it making it more simple? And I know it's never simple to make a fight, but has it helped having the Saudi kind of backing and making it easier to make these top fights as opposed to having them just here? Well, it's, it's making them easier to get made there, but it's making big fights more difficult to make here because the price has gone up. You know, it's the favourite saying, yesterday's price is not today's price. Mm. And that's very much the, the, the situation in boxing. Good luck to the fighters. Not all of them are enjoying the fruits of the Middle East invasion or investment or whatever you want to call it. But of course, people know what people are getting paid to fight out there. And it changes the market value, if you like. But it doesn't change the income or the revenue of a show. So really, the purses over here have remained stagnant or, you know, it's still competitive here. But obviously, when you hit the jackpot and fight in the Middle East, the purses are significantly higher. And, and that is really the focus of any fighter to make sure they get the financial rewards out of their career. So right now, a lot of fighters are looking at how do I land the big shot in Saudi, you know, and we've got to make sure that we make the investment to keep British boxing hot as well. Mm. Eddie, we all like a trilogy. If Catchall wins this, it goes 1-1. Is there a rematch clause? Do you think there'll be a third? There isn't a rematch clause. Um, but at the same time, you know, if Catchall wins and it's a great fight, three would make sense, you know. Um, I'm just pleased to get two done because, like I said, it's one that, it's one that should have happened. It's the crazy thing about boxing, you know. The rematch was the, the natural fight yeah. straight away. And yeah. um, I'm just glad we got there in the end. We're not going to have to wait another two years for that, are we? No, no, no hopefully not. <laughs> okay. no, um, listen, um, I want to get your view. I don't know if you've heard this, but Catchall's promoter at the time, the uh, boxer CEO, Ben Shalom, called for VAR to be introduced after the awful scoring of that fight. He joined Jim White and Simon Jordan this morning to reiterate his point. Have a listen. I think for the big fights, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you have so many, you know, so many decisions at the moment yeah. that are being all the time it's frustrating as a promoter as well because you're the usually the one that gets blamed but when there's such high stakes and when you've got fighters careers going one way or the other based on a decision at the end of the fight and you look at the other sports whether it's tennis whether it's football boxing is a huge sport now and uh the investment now needs to go in so that the fans can trust what's going on see what's going on and we get to the decision I'm not quite sure how you'd use VAR to score no, in boxing no. because what, once the event's passed, you can't go back gold and you missed that in the fourth round. So yeah, no, but, no. what's your view no, on all of that? No, I mean, I think terrible idea. Um, you know, basically VAR, which is great for individual incidents in a football match, and you have seen the game slow down considerably, although you are seeing decisions play out in the correct way. In boxing, you know, the drama really is to go to the scorecards. You know, yeah. when you go... Well, Eddie, what, what, or... what about, right, if there's, let's just say for a moment, say a boxer slips but gets knocked down or yeah. gets knocked down with an elbow. Do you think then we yeah. should use video yeah. refereeing? In fact, good point. The, the WBC, uh, one of the governing bodies, do have video replay within their rules. Just not every commission adheres to it. Oh, OK. They've also got within their rules something called open scoring, which is really interesting. So after four and eight rounds, the scorecards are made public to the fighters, the corners, and the and the media, and the broadcast. Yeah, like and you can see where you are in the fight. I like that, you see, because you could be yeah. thinking you're winning the fight, then you're four rounds behind, then you've got to win by knockout. And it, I think it adds a, a great another idea. dimension. I, I think that, you know, we need to evolve in terms of a sport with the new audience, you know, with that kind of digital yeah. interaction. But at the same time, you know, there is an element of the sport where finding out what the scorecards are when the two fighters come together after 12 great rounds is also compelling. C can I ask? But I, I, like the open I, I like the idea of that. After eight rounds, do the crowd, the audience that are in the arena, do they know as well? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. How wow. exciting does so that make it's, it? It's announced. It's announced by the MC. So, but oh, different really? commissions. So what happens is the governing body, the WBC, they're not a commission. So you've got the British Boxing Board of Control do not allow open scoring. But the WBC want open scoring in every WBC fight. But certain commissions, the British Boxing Board, one of them, don't allow open scoring. I'm in Mexico at the moment and they allow open scoring. So we've got it on our show on Friday night. We had a situation recently with a fight of the year where two guys were in a war. And then we got the, the scores after eight rounds. One guy who thought he was winning was like four rounds behind. He needed a stoppage. He won by stoppage in the 12th round. It was it was unbelievable. And that would have only happened because he saw... Correct. 
Otherwise, he would have got on his bike and thought, yeah. I'm winning the fight. Yeah, you know, like Jack Catchell. Idea. Jack Catchell was coasting the fight, yeah. Yeah. thinking, I've won this by a mile. If he would have seen the scorecards, he might have gone and tried to drop, drop Josh Taylor again. Or I just think it adds yeah. another element. Totally. I don't want it to become too computerized and TV friendly. But as we've seen in other sports, you know, and, and you know, like the World Snooker Shootout, Andy's a great example, yeah. where you're just evolving with a new audience who like that kind of format. And just because, you know, the old audience might not, and I'm probably starting to become that old audience, you've got to bring young young fans into the sport. Mm. And if they can see the scorecards after four and eight rounds, it just adds another element to the broadcast. Yeah, it does. I like that. Eddie, I want to ask you about AJ, obviously taking on Ngannou um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, what are you expecting from the fight? And also, after the fury in Ngannou, are you looking at him a little bit differently now? Oh, yeah. I mean, squeaky bum time. I mean, you know, I think that, on that first fight, I was very outspoken. I thought it would be a mismatch. Mm. You know, this is a guy that's never had a professional fight before, fighting the number one heavyweight in the world. All of a sudden, goes out, drops him, arguably should have beaten him. I mean, it's quite controversial. You know, now the game's changed. You're fighting this guy. You've got a bit more footage of him. I, I still think, I struggle to really believe that someone can just walk into boxing and beat the number one heavyweight in the world and maybe the number two or number three heavyweight in the world. But he's a massive lump. He's got no fear and he punches very, very hard. So AJ's got to be really switched on. And, that, you know, there isn't a lot of reward in this other than hopefully meeting the winner of Fury Usyk. Because mm. if you get beat by a guy that's zero and one, it's not great for the resume. No. You know, uh, so just, this is a dangerous fight. Just before we let you go, uh, a quick word about Conor Ben. Of course, he won in Las Vegas. I watched it actually. I thought it was a real tough fight that he got through. I really mm. enjoyed that fight. Uh, he's had been having a big back and forth with the WBA lightweight champion of the world, Javonta Davis. What's the latest on that? Can we see? Can we see yeah. him or the, you know that fight possibly the UK, the O2? Where are we at? Yeah, that? I mean, we've we've dealt with uh, the appeal and and the decision will be pending on that, which we hope will be positive for us after what is nearly two years now since this test that he first took and Javonta Davis has been very outspoken in fact there hasn't really been a big name that hasn't called out Conor Ben I mean you know Errol Spence Adrian Broner Danny Garcia obviously there's the Chris Eubank talk Kel Brook Javonta Davis so we've just got to land one of those I mean Javonta Davis is a huge draw in America stateside or in the UK that would be a huge fight but you know once we get this decision we'll decide where he's going to fight next and hopefully that'll be a mm -hmm. massive fight in the UK Eddie, thanks for coming on. You're always on the move. You said you're in Mexico. When was the last time you went home, you put your feet up, you had a glass of wine, you watched Love Island? When did you last do that? <laughs> no, no, actually, well, I'll tell you, I don't really drink anymore, but I did watch Love Island, the reunion with my daughter the other night, which was actually very Brilliant. scary. Brilliant. Made me feel incredibly old. And I said to her, please, can you turn this off ASAP? But, you know, How old I've is she? How old is she, Eddie? 14. 14. Five years, she'll be on that. You'll be watching her. Yeah, I, mate, don't. I'll tell you what. Be, I, I, won't say what I won't say what would happen if she goes on there. But you wouldn't be seeing me again. Hey, no always a pleasure. How's your dad's Paul getting on? Yeah, he's still practising. The back's not great, but he's ready He's ready to take you on. Oh, the excuse you know, is coming out. Flying, so. Excuse yeah. is coming out already. The back's we got, not we great. Got, um, obviously, we've got this week, we're in Mexico. Next week, um, we're back home in the UK. Then we're in Orlando, and then we're all over. Then we're in Saudi Arabia for Joshua against Ngannou. And we've also got the Riyadh Season World Snooker Masters, right. the on fight week. So we'll be out there with Ronnie and the guys and actually watched his doc uh, last night. Unbelievable. You, liked you haven't it seen on Amazon, yeah, oh, on Amazon. Fantastic. Great doc. Yeah, fantastic. If you haven't seen it, you I'm watch. looking forward to the Eddie Hearn doc. When that's when's that coming out? Yeah, I mean obviously when the money's right, Andy. We'll um <laughs> There's a long way to go in the story, so of why, why do it too early? We're not even halfway through it. Eddie, listen, always yeah. a pleasure. Have a safe journey back. Thanks so much for your time. Cheers, we'll speak boys, to you in a minute. There you go, the wonderful Eddie. He's great to get on the show. Of course We're very is. lucky. Uh, when we come back, we'll uh, we'll have some fun with the end of show quiz. Live on Drive and Talk Sport. Talk Sport Drive with Andy Goldstein. Monday to Friday afternoon from 4 on AM, on DAB, via the Talk Sport app and on your smart speaker. Talk Sport.